Yeah, so you often hear the phrase um, addiction to fossil fuels. And usually that phrase is uttered in tones of condemnation or derision, uh, blame. Like, what's wrong with us? Why are we so addicted? Uh, as if there's something bad about us. But if you really take that metaphor seriously, and it's actually more than a metaphor, but I'll call it a metaphor now, take that metaphor of addiction seriously, then you want to ask, well, what's driving the addiction? If, if, if your friend is uh, an alcoholic or a drug, drug addict or you know, addicted to something, you're not going to say, well, just why don't you just stop? What's wrong with you? <sighs> I'm not an addict, you know, and you are. What's wrong with you? There must be, you must be a worse person than me. That is not going to be helpful. In fact, that's going to be counterproductive to say, well, just try harder to stop. What you have to do is to, is to unearth and meet and heal the wound or the trauma or the need that is driving the addiction. So if somebody is feeling great pain, physical pain, uh, emotional pain, psychic pain, then they're going to be attracted to alcohol or opioids or something like that. If they're feeling life is meaningless and they don't get uh, the experience of exploring their boundaries uh, and, and, and challenging the world, then maybe they're going to become addicted to gambling or something like that. So, so to understand the origin of our addictions is a step toward healing. And so collectively, the same thing. Why are we burning all the fossil fuels? Why are we consuming all of the resources? Why are we laying waste to one place after another after another? What need are we trying to meet that's unmet? So maybe there's not just one, but I'll name the one I think is the most important. It is the need for connection, the need for belonging. We are in a society where we have become so disconnected from community, from nature, from um, place, that we don't know even who we are anymore. Uh, uh, people in healthy societies, they knew who they were through their relationships because we are not actually separate individuals. That's one of the myths of the dominant civilization on earth. We are not actually separate individuals. We are interbeings. We are formed of our relationships. And that's why if one of your relationships is cut off, you feel like some damage has been done to yourself. So we have no, generally speaking, <clears throat> most people in this society have, have almost no connection to the nature around them. How many trees? Can most people look outside and name? How many plants can they identify and know what medicine they are made, they can be used for, or what their life cycle is, or what kind of insects live on those plants and what their life cycle is? We, it's just, we're looking out and, and the world becomes scenery. And we look out at the people and they become functionaries, um, pro service providers. But do we know, even our neighbors, in most places in America, people don't know the story of their neighbors even and maybe just say hi to them as they pull out of their garage, but are not intimately interconnected. So th through this disconnection, we suffer a deficit of beingness, and we so desperately want to, to restore what has been lost, to, to re-inhabit the fullness of our related selves. So one way to expand the self is through more and more money, more and more property, more and more control. Because to not belong, to not be held by community is a tremendous insecurity. So as a substitute for that security of being known and being taken care of and, and someone's got my back, what if no one has your back? Then you better have a lot of money to make sure you'll be okay. So we have a whole society geared around developing more and more control, having more and more power over the world. And if, you, if, you, if, if that is in place, then endless fossil fuel and resource consumption is inevitable. If that doesn't change, then nothing else is going to change. So I think we have to, to recognize that and begin to heal 
on that level and to recognize that rebuilding community, rebuilding connection to place, uh, rebuilding our feeling of, of being at home in the world, belonging in the world, these are essential components of resolving the ecological crisis. And that means that really um, any action that you take, any, any way that you are in service to healing on any level is part of what people are calling saving the world from climate catastrophe. Because it doesn't do to just try to control the symptom. Fossil fuel use and climate disruption, those are symptoms, not the deepest cause. We've got to, you know, we can't, okay, and, and sometimes there's a, there's a time to, to uh, combat symptoms. If you have a life-threatening fever, maybe you do take the fever down. But if you don't ask what's causing the fever, you're going to be fighting the fever forever and not healing. And in fact, maintaining the disease. Sometimes focus on the symptom actually perpetuates the disease. Like if you think that the symptom, if you think that the important thing is rising global temperatures, then you can fight that symptom with geoengineering. But are you treating the disease? No, you're leaving it, you're allowing the disease to progress even further by mitigating the most obvious symptom. And eventually other symptoms are gonna come because the ways that we are disrupting life on earth are, are way more, that the, the effects of those are way more than um, you know, some linear scale of temperature. The, the, this planet is alive and we are um, really interfering with the deep life processes. Mm -hmm.